Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. It is great to be here today in the great Holy Ghost state of Alabama. Amen. And to be with all of you on this great Thursday morning and worship God in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. It's good to be with all of you that are awake and the rest of you also. Praise God. But I learned a long time ago, just preach. It don't matter who's awake, who's asleep, how big, how small the crowd, nothing matters. Just preach. Hallelujah. And so we are, we're honored to be here in Alabama with your superintendent, Brother Lewis. Always good to see Brother Lewis. Appreciate him very much. Good to be with uh, all of the uh, brethren on the Apostolic Revival Conference uh, Steering Committee. And good to be here in this service. Good to be preaching with uh, Sam Emery and Keith Clark and Larry Booker and whoever else is preaching. Um, it's my understanding that there were some other brethren that were scheduled to preach, but when the A-team couldn't make it, they called in bench players. And so uh, the team's not very deep, so here we are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Brother Booker, I take that back. He He's a six-man award. I mean, he, he could be on any starting team, and Brother... Emory, were you scheduled to be here before, or are you a bench player? You were scheduled. You're an A-team. I got you. All right. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here with the heavy hitters. And uh, it, is a, <clears throat> it is a privilege. It is a privilege. I want to preach to you for a little while today. I, I talked to uh, uh, Brother Stan Davidson I said, what time do you usually get out? About 2.30 or so. And um, he looked at me <clears throat> kind of funny. And then he caught on. He said, uh, we do it once a year. We want all you got. So, hallelujah. So, I can probably tell you all I got by 2.30. Hallelujah. Uh, somebody said the longer you preach, it means the less you're prepared. Because you're preparing while you're talking. So hopefully we can avoid that today. Preach to you a little bit from the Word of God. What a good looking bunch of people. They're probably not near, they're probably not 10% of the people in Mississippi as good looking as you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, thank God for the privilege to be here. I'm so glad my wife is here. Uh, we don't usually, we live together, we don't usually travel together. There's so much going that somebody's got to kind of stay on top of everything happening. And it's good to have my two uh, uh, niece granddaughters here, uh, Heather and Sarah. Sarah is not here yet. She'll get here in her own good time. And... Uh, Good to have Heather here. Heather had never been to Apostolic Revival Conference and is so spiritual she just wanted to come and enjoy the presence of the Lord. And uh, that's the only reason she came. Kind of. Amen. Well, I want to preach to you a little bit today about your middle name. Revival. Hallelujah. That's your middle name in this conference. I want to preach about it a little bit. If you have your Bible, open them with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. We'll read a scripture so that you can be seated. Uh, verse 1 <clears throat> says, this is Ezekiel writing, he said, the hand of the Lord was upon me 
that's a good place to start when you talk about revival. And carried me out in the spirit. That's another good place to start if you're going to have revival. Both of which many people are scared right out of their wits of both of those things. And carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I'll cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin. And put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and a shaking, and the bones came together. You can't deny it, and you can't say they never. Uh, that's words to a song. That's not actually in the Bible. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said... He unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live, so I prophesy. Two prophecies here, one to the bones and one to the wind. And I want to preach to you a little while today about the anatomy of revival. Would you pray with me that the Lord will touch us in the next few minutes? God, let the Holy Ghost move in this place in a supernatural way. God, you don't need a lot of form and fashion. You just need open hearts to the Word of God. I pray that you would touch us and help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Emery. Uh, there is no church that will ever have sustained revival that doesn't get the revelations that you just preached and taught to us this morning. It's not going to happen. And um, so I appreciate uh, Brother Emery, and I appreciate the word of the Lord. Amen. And I want to talk to you about revival today. I want to preach to you a little bit about revival. Uh, to do that, I have to tell you right up front that revival is a very controversial subject even in the United Pentecostal Church. And there is disagreement about revival in the United Pentecostal Church and the apostolic movement and in the larger world. There is, there is disagreement about revival. There are many opinions about revival in the apostolic church. I uh, it's been a couple years ago, I was talking to some dear friends, and in the process of talking to them, we hardly ever talk about what's happening in our local churches because um, they're, they're, we're just getting away and just kind of trying to um, get a breath of fresh air before we go back uh, to warfare. But in the process of conversation, uh, something came up that made us mention that on a particular Sunday, which happened to be the Sunday before I was meeting with these brethren, that at our church, 69, uh, 69 people had received the Holy Ghost on that Sunday. And so in passing, I mentioned that 69 received the Holy Ghost last Sunday. There wasn't much, there wasn't any comment. Everybody just kept on talking about whatever they were talking about. And I, uh, that night, when I laid down, I thought about that for a minute. And then I thought, you know, uh, I don't feel like they had the right response to what I said. And I'm a little curious about why I felt a little strange about what was not said. So the next day, I was with them. And I said, I want to talk to you, brethren, and I want to ask you some questions. 
and uh, I had them in the car so they couldn't get away. And I said, uh, and I don't want you being evasive. I want you to talk to me. These weren't boys. These were men that I considered to be peers. And I said, I told you uh, yesterday, it, just in our passing conversation, I said, you know, we none of us ever talk about it much, but I mentioned that 69 had received the Holy Ghost. And I said, none of you uh, responded. And I kind of felt a little something weird from you when I said that. And I'd like to know uh, what your problem is. And uh, so nobody said anything. I said, no, no, this is not how this is going to work. You're going to talk. You're going to talk to me. You're going to tell me why you didn't seem very happy that 69 got the Holy Ghost. And I said, the truth of the matter is, in the whole nation, you know good and well, there probably wasn't one charismatic church and not more than three or four probably apostolic churches or anybody else that had 69 get the Holy Ghost last Sunday. And you can't even comment. What is your problem? These are all successful men. These are men that have had seen much success in the work of God. But they have a different concept about revival. And so... Uh, one of them finally spoke up and said, well, well, we, we just, we've seen, you know, so many people say people got the Holy Ghost when they didn't really get it, that, you know, we just, just, uh, you know, it would make us remember those things and be a little skeptical. And I said, but, and they named a few people that they were skeptical of. And I said, but, but that's not me. Uh, this is me. Hello. Uh, and, uh, uh, so you doubt that they got the Holy Ghost. So, so that means you doubt they could even get the Holy Ghost. You doubt that 69, theoretically, you would say you believe it, but when it happens, you back away from it. I'm only pointing out that there is controversy about revival, and I made up my mind, Brother Sutton, when I preached today, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to back away. I'm, 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 it, it, I think we passed the day to just gloss over everything. Now, uh, now, if I get to pushing a little too hard today and uh, courtesy demands that I back up, I pray the Lord will give me a little check and say back up and smile and gloss it all over. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that there is resistance to revival and there are all of these different ideas. So my way of getting even with my good brethren was uh, it was a few weeks later that I, that uh, we were on on a particular Sunday. Uh, we baptized 25 on that Sunday in Jesus' name, Amen. And so, so I called I called my good uh, I called one of my good brothers, and uh, of course this time I was a little deceitful, and uh, we talked a little while, and I said, Yeah, well, you know, and I worked the conversation around where I could mention that 25 had got baptized. I said, yeah, we had 25 get baptized, but I said, they didn't all get baptized. <laughs> he laughed. He said, you got me, Nate. Because you see, when you start really talking about revival, you have a lot of opinions even amongst us. And you also have a whole variety, a whole plethora of, of motivations that creates those opinions. Because if you start having revival, and I'm not having revival, and your people find out and tell my people that you're having revival, and I'm not having revival, then it kind of puts me on the spot to try to explain why... You're having revival, and I'm not having revival. And when that happens, uh, there is a little temptation on my part to say, well, they're having revival because, and then think of some way to marginalize the influence of the revival haver over the revival have-notter. Now look, I don't have any ax to grind. I don't have any bone to pick. Uh, you, if you wanted the good preaching, you should have kept the A team. The
the B team just does the best they can. And there may be a time that I ought to be dribbling when I'm shooting, but that's the way the B team does it. So, I'm going to tell you today that God wants all of us to have revival. I'm not mad at you. I'm not browbeating you. I'm not upset. I'm just telling you God wants you to have revival. God wants the apostolic movement to have revival. God wants the United Pentecostal Church International to have revival. If other people are telling you different, love them. But I'm telling you that is incorrect. God expects us and wants us to have revival. Somebody says, but Noah preached all of his life and only eight people got saved. But you ain't Noah. And this is not the flood. This is the day of the apostolic church where the Holy Ghost has been poured out. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise the Lord. Amen. And so when I, when I preach about revival here today, I am not theorizing with you. I am not trying to give you some hypothetical cases. Uh, and uh, my wife's here. She knows that I, I feel most of the time like we're a failure and we're not getting the job done. And because I think in comparison to what God wants to do, uh, I am pathetic and our church is pathetic compared to what God would like for it to be and like for it to do. On the other hand, sometimes you have to have some kind of validation that, uh, that what you're preaching is something that's not just a theory to you, and we're working on that. Tuesday night, uh, we had church. Uh, my son-in-law taught a tremendous Bible study about the church. The end of service, made an altar call. Five or six got the Holy Ghost on Tuesday night. And on top, you know what, though? You know what, though? There were some folks there from out of state that, that was there on that Tuesday night, and they were, their job transferred them. They were looking for a church. And they said at the end of the service, they said, the church we're from, our midweek service is never more than an hour, and this service is far too long. And so is there any churches in the area that has a midweek service that's only an hour long? I want to tell you that yeah, I'm just showing you the skewed concept that church is not important enough anymore to take up your time. It's more important to be able to go home and eat cheese and crackers or whatever the guy's going to do. I'm just telling you, if you don't want revival any more than that, and if church can be all boxed up and sewed up and knitted tight and just a little chunk of your life, then you're, I'm just telling you, you're wasting your time talking about revival. You don't love Jesus enough. You, would, you want to be in his house if you want to be with his people if you really love him. Come on, let's praise him again. Amen. Now I want to tell you, I'm just preaching today, okay? I'm not mad, I'm just preaching, okay? Here we are, preaching away. Uh, the reason I say that is people will get this tape and they'll do all the, well, he's mad at this or he's picking it. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not picking any bone. If you got hit, it's because you were in the direct line of fire. And you needed to get hit and you need to learn something and you need to humble yourself instead of being so stinking cocky that nobody can ever talk to you about revival. We're gearing up. I won't be home Sunday. I'll be in Coleman, Alabama. We dedicated Jeremy Wilbanks to the Lord. We dedicated his wife, Vonda Lee, to the Lord. Now we're going to dedicate their fat baby to the Lord on Sunday. Amen. And so it's obvious who the baby takes after. But anyway. Oh, glory. Are oh, we having a good time today? Hey, look, we might as well have a good time. We're here. We might as well enjoy it. All right. So, so we're gearing up for Sunday. This Sunday, uh, we're believing God for 100 to receive the Holy Ghost at, at home at the Rock Church on a normal Sunday. We're believing God for that.
Now, I'm going to tell you, the, uh, we're not, uh, by any means, any stretch of the imagination, have we attained anything. I am just telling you, though, that before we can have a thousand get the Holy Ghost on a Sunday, we've got to figure out how to have a hundred get the Holy Ghost on a Sunday. And before you can figure out, I can remember when I was, I would knock myself dead if I could get one to get the Holy Ghost every six months. Amen. So I'm not here talking like some guru. I've been there when it's knocking myself dead to get one person prayed through every six months. But you, but after that, then you go for one a quarter, and then you go for one a month, and then you go for one a week, and then you go for two a week, and then. You, but you don't give up. You keep building brick after brick until the momentum is built up for a great revival. Now I have not yet got to my introduction. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. We just built a massive building. It's a great building. And, I, and, and, and we're going we're gonna to use every square inch of it for God. And uh, I don't know how we got here other than just preaching revival. I just, this morning I got up, I, I said to myself, self, Did you think of the fact that you are presently negotiating four multi-million dollar deals at one time? I just thought of that. Now, I don't have anything, so don't come asking for a loan. And I'm not going to ask you for a loan. I'm asking you for an offering. Just kidding. But, but right now... This is all part of the work of God that I am in the process. When they go, one for three million, one for four million, one for 17 million, one for 10 million. And those are all four different deals. They all have different structure. They all have different negotiation. They have, I work on it every day. Some of them have been working on for six, seven years, others for a year or two and so forth. All of it has to do with revival. All of it has to do with accomplishing the work of God. But a long time ago, it was, it was working on one dollar. It was, I used to buy my suits at a place. The first suit I bought was five dollars and the second one I bought was one dollar. It was at Mrs. Stone's. You haven't heard of it. It's not on the same street as even men's warehouse. But I am just telling you that if we're going to have revival, we can't sit around and say, I'm not capable of having revival. At some point, we've got to get over our complex far enough to say, well, if God's going to use somebody, he's going to have to use me. Now to our introduction. <laughs> the scripture I read to you just a while ago, of course, was written by Ezekiel who is the most dazzling of all the prophets. There is no prophet like the prophet Ezekiel. And he prophesied in a time like ours in which revival was needed. And during this time that he prophesied, if you read all the prophets in the Bible, you'll find that Ezekiel was the most spirit-led of all of the prophets. And when he says, the spirit led me up or took me up, it is a repeated thing. When you read through Ezekiel, you find he's always being lifted up by the Spirit. And he's carried here or he's carried there. And sometimes he's talking to you and then he flies away from us somewhere on his airy course. And uh, I, 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 read, I read and preached one time about when Ezekiel, he's the only guy I know in the Bible that rode in God's car. God's got a car. I can't preach about God's car today, but God has a car. And Ezekiel's the only human I know that ever rode in God's car. He described the wheels. They were big mag wheels with low profile tires. They were they, they were not gold plated, they were gold. And they and the and and the car was painted bright colors. There was rainbow colors. It went over in Merced, I'll tell you that by his brother Avery. Anyway, it was a it was a spectacular car. And uh, and uh, it was a holiness car. In fact, <laughs> In fact, he said it's a holy car. All I can tell you is anytime you see God coming in his car, it's going to be a holy car. If it's not a holy car, it's not God driving that buggy. But today, today we are not looking at him driving God's car. Uh, um, he is a different kind of guy. Uh, to read Ezekiel and to appreciate him, you have to understand that he was educated 
by visions. And uh, he was not the master of linear thought or logic or analysis. Uh, uh, he was not the greatest analyst that there was. But he would ask the question, if you told him that, he would say, but is there not a world unseen? And, and uh, the fact of the matter is, you and I haven't even seen ourselves, much less anything else. We don't even know ourselves. And, and uh, then when we read Ezekiel, one would say, well, it just must be a spiritual dream that he had. And it wasn't literal reality. But I, I want to just kind of step off here uh, this morning and, and, and ask the question, how presumptuous are our little finite brains to discount a vision from God in the name of reality? In fact, I'm going to just push a little further and ask you the question, when you get into things of God, what is reality? And how do we even uh, comprehend what all is reality? Some things that our flesh calls real or not real at all, but are only transitory and are passing away. And uh, they are misleading uh, they are misleading shadows. Uh, but men like Ezekiel hold back the curtain a little bit, and they give us glimpses of sublime possibilities that are far beyond what we would get every day in our everyday life. Uh, and I would propose to you that it, when it comes to the things of God, uh, reality is a term that is not yet exhaustively understood. When we talk about reality with God, it expands everything out to a dimension in which we have to say, God, I, I, I want to go there with you. I don't know how to drive this car, but I want to ride in it. I, I want to be a part. And so when we talk about apostolic revival, we first have to decide whether we're willing to have our mind stretched, our heart stretched, our energy stretched, and say, God, wherever you lead me, I will follow. Oh, let's worship and magnify the name of the Lord again. And so, Ezekiel does all these things. But today, Ezekiel is not on his chariot of holiness with his fiery wheels. Today, in today's text, he stands on the edge of massive hopelessness in which the people have said, our hope is gone. The fact of the matter is, I think he is standing on the edge of our world. He's not standing on some heavenly oasis, viewing all of the glories of God, but he is standing at the graveyard of human hope. And he says that God set me down in the midst of a valley of dry bones. And he said it was an open valley, and the bones were very many, and they were very dry. And he said, I passed him round about from a vista, an observation point. God said, now walk around these bones. And if you look at the Hebrew, it emphasizes the thoroughness of the walk around them, that he was to do a study of them, that he was to research and observe uh, everything about them that was possible. And also the Hebrew emphasizes the amazing number of bones that was involved in this study that he was to do. It appears when he looks at it that it is a scene that was a major catastrophe. Uh, the, the Ezekiel was not only a prophet, but he was also a priest. And as a priest, he knew the importance of proper treatment of the dead. And while he's looking at it, the question that God asked him is, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? It is a question about revival. It is, it is can these people in these extreme circumstances, can they have revival? Can revival erupt out of such dire conditions uh, where there's terrorism, and where there's an increase of Islam, and where there is immorality, and where there's Hollywood's hedonism, and where there is the gay agenda, and where there is corrupt politicians, uh, and where there is prejudice of every kind, and where it looks like you could never have revival, and everything looks dead spiritually. God asked him, can these bones live again?
And when Ezekiel looks at this, it appears to be the scene of a great battle because he said, these are the slain. It is a revival is a battleground and it's war and many falter in the revival battle. And it is clear when you read the context that an enemy did this. It was not a natural death. And Ezekiel is aware that revival has not been treated well. That revival has experienced a devastating loss. And that everything else is lost in the battle but the bones. There is no flesh left. There is no muscle left. There is no spirit, no strength, no movement. The eyes are gone and they no longer have vision. The ears are gone and they no longer can hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Uh, there are vultures that are older than the earth that is consuming the brain matter and Therefore, the brain is no more thinking about revival. And everywhere Ezekiel looks, it is as though there are demons sitting on bald and ugly rocks uh, that are resting on their haunches, chewing human jerky, long, dried muscle tissue of now lifeless men and women. It is extreme dryness. It indicates that they had been dead for a long time. The blush of youth is long gone. No longer do they have the dreams of their youth uh, and the visions that God gave them. Their determination has waned. Their strength is gone. Uh, all of the things that you hoped for when you were an idealistic young teenager boy or girl, when you knew nothing except God's grace in each conference that you went to, and each Sunday service and midweek Bible study. And you were so filled when the preacher preached about global impact and world evangelism. Your heart rang and resonated with a faith that a gung-ho spirit that said anything can be done. But now all of the flesh is gone off of that. And all of the vision, you've settled down. You've decided that I will be in my city, in my home, in my circumstance. Uh, I, I don't guess it's going to happen because now I'm 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years. And I guess it's never going to happen. So I need to figure out how to be happy. Maybe I can just get some little uh, position of fellowship and all will be well. But somewhere, somewhere the vision's gone and the buzzards are setting, eating the last of your dreams. Your dreams are washed out and sun bleached. And like the prophet, when you go there, you can hear the silent footfall and the puff of dust with each step. Uh, there's nothing to see of your dreams anymore but the little puffs of dust that rise up because revival has gone. At one time, some of you had hopes. Uh, you had hopes for your family. You had hopes for your ministry. You had hopes for your church. Uh, you had visions, but somewhere they got killed. And now they lay bleached on the valley floor and randomly left the molder where they fell. The corpses are even denied a proper burial. Nothing seems to be happening. Wind and wild beasts have scattered them everywhere. And you are sitting there. The raucous coin of the carrion eaters uh, can be heard as they celebrate your death and pick your bones apart. But I'm here to tell you that somebody has rose up to say the question, Can these dry bones live again? Oh, let's clap our hands and love him again. And you can read it for yourself, the lament that is found in Scripture. We didn't read that far, but it's in there. Israel is giving a rhyming chant. Our bones have dried up, and our hope is vanished. 
we are doomed. It won't work. You can't stand for what we stand for and have revival. We've tried and given up. If you can't beat them, join them. And so it comes to whose report will you believe? It comes to will you believe the report of Ezekiel 37? Or will you believe the report of the doomsday sayers? There is a malaise of despondency and pessimism and cynicism that is spread across a significant portion of the apostolic movement until there is a satisfaction. If you're part of that, I'm not picking on you today. I'm just preaching to you. I can't change it all. I can just preach about it, and the Spirit has to change it all. But I'm going to tell you, by the grace of God, I am not going to be a part of it because I know what I know without I know that I know that I know what I know. And so there's some issues involved about answering the question, can these bones live again? And the first issue that must be resolved is answering the question, will you walk about your bones one more time and view them and study them from every angle? God told Abraham, you're going to have a promised son. He tried to do it in the flesh with Ishmael. He thought it satisfied every demand of God. Fourteen years later, he wakes up one day and God says, you're going to have that son. He didn't want it to happen. He tells his wife Eve and she doesn't want it to happen. I mean his wife Sarah and she doesn't want it to happen. And Abraham and Sarah, they said, no, we've already got the flesh has already provided a satisfactory setting of comfort and familiarity for us. We don't want this. We don't, don't give us this promised son. In fact, if you read the Bible, a quote, a direct quote of Abraham is, Oh, that Ishmael might live before me and before thee. When you read God's response, there isn't one. Because there's nothing that really has reality except it's part of the creative word. And the creative word is that the promised son is coming. There is no word. There is no, everything else is an illusion. And so I can see Abraham say, Sarah, uh, he said we're going to have a son. And Sarah, no. That's a 40-year-old prayer request. I can't stand the disappointment. I can't go to the crux of an emotional high and then it not happen. Emotionally, it costs too much. What it takes to have that son, Abraham, no. I just can't take disappointment there anymore. I've had all I can stand all of my life. And so the question is, Will you walk around your promise one more time? Will you walk around the bleached bones one more time and view them and study them? Not just a casual look, but the Bible says God told uh, Ezekiel, he said, he set me down in the midst of them and, and he caused me to pass around them and he immersed me in them and he made me become familiar with it again. And he made me face the revival question, can these bones live again? Time is an opaque lens and it's hard to see through it. And everyone desires to peer therein. We know that they lived yesterday, but can they live again in our day? There is no question that, that, that is, that's where it starts. Are you willing to revisit it? I would propose to you that there are a lot of people not willing to revisit it. I could, give, I could spend two hours talking about why people don't revisit, giving you examples of people that reject the, the possibility of even confronting the question, can the bones of revival live again in my city, in my home, in my personal life? It's, it, it, they, they don't want to go there. 
He's talking about a revival, not just a small revival, but a revival on a rare scale. It's of a nation. It's not just a people, but an army. And he reveals that there is an anatomy to revival and a genetics to revival. There's an anatomy to revival because revival has a structural design. It's not just harem scarum. It has a it has an identifiable structural design. Can these bones live? They're all in a pile. They're all in a mess. But can these bones live again? And so, there are three things that revival does not do. You'll have to make your own applications. Time doesn't permit us to flesh out everything. The first thing revival does not do is it does not start with the present. Revival does not arise out of the here and now. Revival starts in yesterday. It doesn't come from the here and now, it comes from the there and then. In fact, to have revival, you have to escape the here. Maybe this is why we find Ezekiel flying all over the place. Because he has to get out of town. Because revival doesn't start in the mundane activities of every day. It doesn't start on what's happening politically or what's happening uh, all of socially. It doesn't start by focusing on the present. The precedent is already set. There, they're saying, God, we need revival now. And God's saying, okay, then if you want revival now, follow me to yesterday. You don't get here to revival by focusing on here where you are. To get to revival, you have to go back. We cannot. We can only establish apostolic revival from the past, not, for the, not from the future and not from uh, the present. Our understanding of the whole structural uh, of spiritual reality arises out of the past. Uh, and unless you go back to that past, uh, revival starts in yesterday. I want to drive that home. Revival starts in yesterday. You may make fun of yesterday. You may laugh about yesterday. You may be some smart aleck that thinks you know so much that yesterday has nothing to teach you. But I'm telling you, if you have an apostolic revival, you're going to go back and you're going to get a new reverence and respect and revelation out of yesterday. I would say to you to beware of he who discounts yesterday. Beware of he who comes in this flashy, shiny, iridescent suit of the future or the discoverer of the shiny and the new but the untried and not fully cognized out of the present. Uh, God says, come on, Ezekiel, if you want to shake your world, you come on and take a little walk with me back to yesterday, and I'll show you how you're going to shake your world. But you're not going to shake it unless you're willing to go back to yesterday and ponder the bones and immerse yourself in the bones and become very familiar with the bones. And I can tell you now, the apostolic movement, the United Pentecostal Church, or anybody else, is not going to go any further until you have a clear understanding of these bones. Revival also, number two, doesn't start by studying the future. I enjoy the writings of people like Barna and Sweet and Eason and others with their sincere attempts to read the times and ferret out how the church should operate. But if God was here talking to Ezekiel today, he would say, lay your books down. Put aside your demographic studies and your growth patterns. Lay aside your fixation with emerging societal patterns and postmodern societal issues. He would say, let's take a stroll down through yesterday, the secret territory of revival, and let's see if we can't find the truth. Because we are not extrapolating the future revival out of the present. This is what corporations do. They get people to try to prognosticate What's going to happen next? This is what the stock exchange tried. What's going to happen next so we know which way to jump? Where to invest? Real estate going up, going down. All of the stuff that's involved with all of that. They're trying to constantly, out of the present, extrapolate what is going to happen. And then others are trying to figure all of it out. But I'm here to tell you, revival is not a guessing game. It's not a child's mystery maze called 
uh, find what's right for the church today. Everybody, there are, there are preachers that every new little gimmick, every new toy, every new thing that comes down the pike, they think that's the answer. And they are exhausted jumping from thing to thing. I want to tell you, you can, you can circumvent all of that and go back to a solid, substantial, lasting revival that is apostolic. And I'll just stop to say, if that's the stuff you want, then so be it. This is America. You can do what you want to do. But that's not what I want. I am looking for an apostolic revival that when people get saved, it transforms their lives. Uh, they fall in love with Jesus. Uh, church is not an afterthought to them. It's the first thing in their life. Oh, let's praise him again. And you got to understand and make up your mind that revival will never be cut from yesterday's umbilical cord. Not apostolic revival. It's a captive of the past. Revival can never escape from its parents and its grandparents. It inhabits the house of those bones. That's where it comes from. The third thing revival doesn't do is it doesn't start with the flesh. It starts with bones. The revival that we're looking for is not a revival out of the flesh. It's not a revival in the Super Bowl. I understand they've got apostolic churches setting up screens in their churches so they can watch the Super Bowl, invite everybody in as an outreach, evangelism, invite them in, have chips and watch the Super Bowl in the church fellowship hall. Apostolic churches, United Pentecostal churches. Now, when people hear this tape, those guys that are doing that will all get twisted out of shape and get their panties in a wad. But I'm not mad at you, boys. I'm just giving you a little correction today. When you preach, you can preach what you want to preach. But today, I happen to be preaching. And I'm here to tell you, you will never have an apostolic revival out of the flesh. I won't have one out of the flesh. You won't have one out of the flesh. Nobody will have one out of the flesh. And you won't have one by trying to figure out the direction of a directionless populace and then try to follow them instead of them following you. It's amazing how many people don't even have a basic revelation of the gospel, that the gospel has a con confrontational component, a polarizing component, an element that you can never eradicate from it because it, 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 con it, it confronts the worst that is in man. It, the very first thing you have to do is not have joy. The very first thing you have to do in the gospel is have sorrow. It sounds like it's all convoluted. And to the human reason, it sounds like it would never work. You've got to start with repentance, which is godly sorrow. It sounds like nobody would ever want to go to a church like that. But you have to have a spiritual revelation of how the gospel works. You have to know more than a surface understanding of how a human is made up. And when you get that revelation, you're not afraid to preach repentance. And you don't try to soft pedal the gospel. You just preach it the way it is. Aren't you glad you're in it today? Church services that are trying to ape TV and movie people, which are all tremendously unclean. And the ad nauseum addiction to artificiality and fashion and dye and makeup and jewelry and prostitution of every value that was ever taught so that they can gain some fleeting notoriety. Hallelujah. That's, that's, that's the divergent. That's the that's the that's the why in the road where we're at. That's this is where you make up your mind. Can, can, can you can you tell yourself that I, I need to find out where real revival is? I, if I make a mistake at this at this why, it's a mistake that I won't be coming back from because I'm I'm gonna make commitments that I can't back up from it, and my people will never return again. I've had preachers tell me, I'd like to go back from my decision, but my people won't go back. Oh no, no, no. Because once the flesh rules, uh, the flesh is deluded, the flesh thinks it's right, uh, and the flesh is never right when it comes to apostolic revival. 
Uh, I, 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 I'm just preaching, but I got to tell you, I, I feel a little bit extra touch of anointing in this building. I feel the Holy Ghost has moved into this place. Could, could, you, could everybody just stand with me a minute? Let's just kind of lift our hands and, and let's kind of entertain the Holy Ghost for a minute and see what he may do here in the next few seconds. <laughs> Holy Ghost is here. Holy Ghost is here. Holy Ghost is here. Hey man, you may be seated. Revival. Everybody say revival. Everybody said starts. Everybody said with. Everybody said bones. The skeletal shape of revival was already established hundreds of years before you and I got here. If there is a revival, it will look like yesterday's revival. If there's a mighty army raised up, it will be on the same skeletal framework. As yesterday. You don't have to guess what it will look like. You can go look like what it was then, and that's what it'll look like now. Revival doesn't grow new bones or a new shape. We are not blindly seeking the shape of revival this morning. We know the shape of revival. The skeletal frame doesn't change. The revival of tomorrow will have legs where yesterday's revival had legs. The revival that we have, if it's a real revival, will have arms where yesterday's revival had arms. And feet where yesterday's revival had feet. Uh, and it'll have the same head. And it will have the same mind. And it'll have the same thoughts from that head. The mind that, had, that controlled revival of yesterday and made them a holy people. It's not going to be some mind that's abdicated all of that. No, it's the same mind, the same head, the same shape. You can recognize it. There's no question what yesterday's revival, the skeletal shape of it was. It was Acts 2.38. It was the name of Jesus. It was signs, wonders, and miracles. It was holiness. It was separation. And I just got to tell you today, oh God, help me to say this right, with the right attitude. But I got to tell you, people who don't have the Holy Ghost, can tell me many things. But I don't want them coming to me and trying to tell me about apostolic revival. There's not, there's little or nothing they're going to be able to tell me about apostolic revival. I've already got something that tells me about apostolic revival. If you don't agree with what this says, if you don't baptize in Jesus' name, if you don't preach the Holy Ghost, if you don't preach signs, wonders, and miracles, if you don't preach separation from the world, you have something, but you don't have an apostolic revival. You don't have the skeletal structure that's already given to us. Let's make it unmistakably clear today, there is no apostolic revival outside of Acts 2, 1 through 4 and Acts 2, 38. Now you can dance around that. You can compromise that. You can get embarrassed about that and <laughs> he's a little too strong. You can do whatever you want to do with it. That's, that's up to you. I'm just telling you what apostolic revival looks like. But the bones are scattered. Ezekiel found the bones scattered. There was a loss of structure. There was no arrangement. They'd lost their order. No life. Where there is not apostolic revival order, there will eventually be no life. Not only is life missing, but the necessary arrangement of the pieces that is essential to life is not there. Life cannot come from such confusion. Arrangement must come first. Can these bones live again? Thou knowest, Lord. But arrangement has to come first. And when it happens, that arrangement comes. The arrangement of the bones has primacy of place because revival has a skeletal composition. That's why we can't look to the world 
to tell us how to have apostolic revival. That's why you don't want to get fixated on reading everybody's book about how to revival that doesn't even believe Acts 2.38, which is the basic foundation for apostolic revival. Now, I know, I know a lot of folks today are talking about pluralism. And they are, there are people advocating derangement instead of arrangement in the name of pluralism. But, but to be deranged is insanity. Revival is defined. Revival has a predetermined shape. There is, a, there is a science of structure called anatomy. It's not just a jumble of bones, but it has an anatomical design. You don't just say, I think I'll put this here, and I think I'll put that there, and I believe I'll put the leg bone in his left ear. Oh, no. Some have tried to randomly hook it all together. you got to go back and walk around it and see how it's supposed to be done. You don't just start with sinew and ligaments. You can have everything, but if you don't have Bones, you won't have apostolic revival. We're not talking about some amoebic blob called revival carried on the back of carnality. You young preachers, if you forget everything else I said, please remember this. Before you preach to the wind, you must preach to the bones. You got a lot of colorful people saying, prophesy to the wind to come. But that was the second prophecy. The first one he said is you prophesy to the bone. Until you get the structure straight, don't be talking to me about the wind. Because if you prophesy to the wind before you prophesy to the bones, you just got a lot of hot air. And that revival will not survive long because it doesn't have anything to hang itself on. It's an amoeba revival. It's an invertebrate revival. You know what a vertebrate and invertebrate? Invertebrate just means animals which have no backbone. We got a lot of folks who's creating invertebrate revivals. No definition, no shape, no recognition. Don't have the biblical skeletal structure. Many think the old structure is bleached and without hope. And all they'll have is a formless mass that they're calling revival. But it's not really revival that they're having. It's something out of a freak show of some kind. Because the primary bone to revival, the primary bone to the human body is backbone. Revival without apostolic bones can't stand up. It can't walk, so it has to be carried around on some new cart. What's new this year? What program are we coming up? What's the latest trick to trick out my church service with? It's not apostolic revival. I read about a woman. She was like, I don't know, 30-something years old. It was uh, very unusual that she was still alive. She weighed 37 pounds. And her bones would all break. Even if she yawned, it would break her bones. And her body kept caving in on itself. Most of the time, it's short-lived. The Bible says of the righteous, his bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. How are your bones today? Revival has to have that backbone. Maybe we can resurrect some backbone here today. Because down that backbone goes the spinal cord, which carries the signals from the brain. And it's the backbone that protects the spinal cord. And if you don't have a backbone, that spinal cord gets beat up. And, gets beat up, and the messages that you're getting from the head get all messed around. I started to say they get all screwed up, but I'm not at home. you got to have that backbone. But what a lot of folks are producing is freak shows, sideshows, grotesque monsters. Right over here, folks. <laughs> Step right up. 
See the most amazing thing ever, a body with no bones. Look at the eyes lolling and sagging on the face. I know it's gross, but keep looking. And look, the ears are recessed into the brain because there's, there's no skeleton. It's, it's a grotesque blob, and I know it can't walk. It doesn't have two feet to walk because it's all just... It, but look, isn't it amazing, this freak of nature that is being created. And this is what the charismatic world is creating. And this is what uh, people are creating that don't have any structure. I'm going to tell you, if you want a real apostolic revival, it'll work. It'll work in 2007. It'll be working in 08. If God tarries, it'll be working in 09. You don't have to worry. It'll always work. You'll have growth. You'll have power. You'll have anointing. You'll have triumph. You'll have victory. But you've got to have structure of the bone. Well, let's everybody clap our hands and pray. Hallelujah. But I got to go just a little further. Is it 2.30 yet? <laughs> just a little further. The question was not, do you see these bones? The question was, Brother Davidson, can these bones live? Now, there's a lot of folks that will shout about getting the bones structured, but they get real nervous when the bones start living. There's more to it than valuing the bones and wanting them arranged properly. Now, you may doubt that the bones could live, but Ezekiel didn't doubt it. Those bleached and desiccated skeletons he saw them as the secret repository of revival. Where other people didn't see that. See, I, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but this is an important point. People have a tendency to be very confident in their ability to judge what's good and not, especially preachers. And so, if you are thinking on a level that is still colored with flesh, and human rationality. Then you'll look at those bones and you'll say, my God, that's old, that's old fashioned junk. Put that on the trash pile. But the spiritually sensitive Ezekiel looks at those beat up, pocked old bones and he keeps looking closer. And he sees those bones and he starts thinking how they fit together. And God says, Ezekiel, can they live? Thou knowest. Okay, here's how we're going to know. Prophesy to these bones. Preach the good old message. Preach it in truth and love. Preach it with kindness. Preach it with compassion. Preach it with a burden for the lost. But he starts preaching it. A lot of people are so confused about how to rub revival if they would just start preaching the truth with a spirit of rejoicing, that would increase what they're doing, quantum leaps, just that much. But instead, they've got 45 videos from people that don't even know the truth. They're, they're checking through those videos. Church, I think I'll show this to you today. And so... We know the bones have to have structure. But however, there are those who are fixated on skeletal reconstruction of yesterday's form. But they're very nervous about the skeletal reconstruction having life. They would like to get them all reconstructed. It's like I heard of one, at least supposed to be apostolic church, recently that the wife was speaking and said, oh, my husband just, people were running the aisles at some church or something. She said, my husband just got up and told our church there'll be no more aisle running in this church because it's not uh, biblical, it's not scriptural. There'll be no more aisle running. And we, we're, going, we're going to have form. We're gonna have form, but life, life, creates its own expressions. The Bible doesn't have to say they ran the aisles. 
where there is life and rejoicing. Where there's life and rejoicing. I, I had one sister, one of us, who is a very educated thinker, writer, author, who watched some of us shouting and dancing in the spirit and made the statement, you never find Jesus doing that. Mmm. Mmm. You better look again, sis. Right. There's one place the Bible says Jesus rejoiced, and if you look at the Greek word rejoice, it means making loud noises and twirling around. So Jesus wasn't always just saying, oh, my little children. There were times he would, oh, 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 this is great. Life. Some folks' idea of let everything be done decently in order is like tombstones. Every tombstone is perfectly placed and the name scratched in it. Nobody ever says amen. Nobody ever says hallelujah. Nobody ever runs the graveyard. The bones are all in order. We got people that get real nervous when life starts. You know what? If you have new babies being born, you got them getting away out in the aisle. You got them with dirty diapers. You got to have a nursery. They're irritating when they cry, but they're so cute, and they are life, and they represent revival. If you don't like babies, you can't have revival. If you just want skeletal form, you're going to live in an apostolic graveyard that will never know life. He didn't just say prophesy to the bones. He said prophesy to the breath, the wind, that it'll come into them. Oh, Lord, I got to quit. It's like the Baptist pastor that got so mad at Pentecostals because they abused the scriptures, took them out of context in all kinds of ways. And I'm sure he could find plenty of abuse on our part because of our ignorance. But you know what? If what we take out of scripture agrees with other scripture, even if that's not exactly the local context that that scripture was written about, God just honors us. And he was praying one day and he was saying, God, they take all these scriptures out of context. God, this makes me so mad. God, they use these scriptures all wrong. They use them this way. They use them that way. And this Baptist preacher said, and finally God spoke to me and said, well, at least they use them. And he proceeded to get the Holy Ghost. I read about a man who, per, who, who, who perfected an embalming technique where he could take dead bodies and make them look like they were still alive. And that he would steal bodies and set them up at a dinner table and keep them set up there. He, 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 would, he, he would steal the body of a beautiful woman and set her up at dinner and and of a man that, that would be somebody that he uh, uh, emulated, and he would set him up, and, and, and at night he would come and have dinner with all of these embalmed dead. You know, there's some of our schools and churches that ought to have classes in systematic skeletology. <laughs> I, I just thought of that. That's a... <laughs> they grasp the shape but they don't understand the dynamic. And revival not only has an anatomical structure, revival has a genetic, a genealogical connection to yesterday, and it all comes out of yesterday, and it's a living spirit that has never died. And those people are still alive. They are in heaven, but they're still alive, and they're still connected to revival. And we have a genetic connection to them. And many of the scriptures that we take that talk about, for example, this generation shall not pass. And we try to say, how long is a generation? 48 years, 33 years, 72 years, 
14 years, whatever. I'm not sure that scripture means that at all. When it says this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, I think it may mean this genetic seed, no matter how bad it gets, will never pass away because it's a genetic seed of infinitude. It has transcended time and space and matter and dependence upon air in this world. It is, we are, folks, if you don't know it yet, we are, this is not pie in the sky. This, we are tapped into the infinite through the baptism of the Holy Ghost that connects us to yesterday's revival with the same dynamic that they had. So all of the skeleton controllers, you can control a whole valley full of properly arranged skeletons. But skeleton controllers have a nervous breakdown when things start shaking. I have a friend who is one of the foremost theologians in America. He is positioned is one of the highest in administration of theological institutions. He is not apostolic, but he is Pentecostal. Years and years ago, I had him as a professor, and then eventually he became, uh, you know, it's like, it's like knowing a guy that became the president, you know. Down here, he was just George, but, you know. And so our relationship, a friendship has continued, even though we disagree. He came to our church one night a couple years ago. At present, <clears throat> if I understand right, less than 3% of all new converts in an Assemblies of God organization, when they come in, less than 3% are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidence of speaking in other tongues. <clears throat> and only approximately half of its membership has received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. So they're, they're used to a little more structure and a little less dynamic. And he came, and that night was one of those Sunday nights. And it was just a lot of dynamic, a lot of happy people. They're just going, and people running everywhere, and traffic cops, and whatever it took. After church, we went out and ate. I said, well, what'd you think? He said, you know, if you would take, let me close, let me, let me close this. Let me close this so we. He said, if you would take some of that energy and you would use it for outreach. Now understand, this is one of the fastest growing churches. I mean, and people have to make changes to be a member of our church. Not like a lot of the other churches that are fastest growing in town. That does all the changing so you'll keep coming. And... He said, you know, if you could help your people to channel that energy, once a professor, always a professor, to channel that energy into missions, outreach. I smiled. I looked at him. I listened to him. And I thought, you are so ignorant of spiritual dynamics. You think that when you use energy to worship, you are exhausting the supply of energy to witness. You don't understand that when you use energy to worship, it multiplies the energy for the mission. In God, the more you worship, the stronger you get. The more you praise, the stronger you get. The more you believe, the more you get. You never wear it out. God is an inexhaustible supply. Now, I'm through, but I want to tell you, those people that, that, that we, and we have them in, in 
the apostolic movement and in the United Pentecostal Church that it scares their pajamas off for somebody to say. And they're so afraid somebody's going to abuse the gifts of the Spirit that they'd rather have no gifts of the Spirit. You can't abuse what you ain't got. They get terrified when things start happening. They're like uh, the little rascals. Any of you ever listened to little rascals on the radio when you was 50 years ago? Little rascals when they're running through a graveyard. Spanky says, oh, this isn't going ha- to hurt anything. And they hear an owl hoot. And Spanky starts running and says, let's get out of here. And the alfalfa says, wait on me. And they're running through that graveyard saying, let's get out of here. That's how a lot of folks are about a move of God in an apostolic church. Oh, my God. This is out of No, this isn't out of control. This is a nursery. Babies are being born. And so I close today by saying, are your hopes gone? Are your dreams dried up? My recommendation is walk around those bones one more time. Take a look, good look at them. Look real close. If you look real close, you'll find that they're the secret repository of a powerful apostolic revival. Let's worship again. Let's love the Lord.